This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash uctv prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. finish our session this morning, a topic that uh, should be of great interest to all of us uh, working every day. Uh, Professor Gould from our uh, Department of Radiology and Biomedical Imaging will give us an update on how to minimize our radiation exposure in the operating room. Um. Thank you, Mike. Well, now for something completely different. Uh, so uh, what's the issue here? Well, uh, we know that radiation is getting an awful lot of publicity of late. Uh, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, uh, certainly have highlighted all of the problems that have occurred, uh, unfortunate uh, incidents of hair loss, for example, in uh, CT scans. Um, they, they haven't talked about the slide that was shown, I think, by Dr. Weaver that showed uh, how the detection of aneurysms with CT was 93% compared to the 30th percentile or somewhere in the 30% for, uh, for plain films. So we, we get very little of the benefits and lots of the risk. And uh, you do have to put, complete the equation. You do have to recognize how powerful imaging with radiation is and how it benefits the, the patients in com compared to the theoretical risk, primarily for operators of the equipment, these relatively low levels day in and day out, is, is a theoretical increase in, in cancer. For the patients who are really uh, very sick, they have complex disease uh, or trauma, we're not so much worried about the the, the long-term effects of that radiation, even though some of them may be young. We're really worried about acute effects, which is an unusual setting. And the reason we're worried about acute effects, mainly skin burns, is that these image-guided procedures are increasingly complex. That, that has been enabled by the imaging equipment, which is really very powerful at this point in time, can give you spectacular images uh, but at a cost to some degree of higher radiation levels. So the procedure times have gone up. There's potentially high skin doses in a lot of these procedures and acute skin effects, but these are normally preventable in most settings. And the, the doses to OR personnel have also gone up to the surgeons and attending personnel uh, because of the long procedure times. So very quickly, where does the radiation, let's talk about personnel exposure. Where does that radiation come from? Well, that radiation really comes from the patient in the form of what we call scattered radiation. It is uh, much less intense than the intensity of the beam, than the dose rate going into the patient. And it is to some extent controlled by collimation and by moving the detector closer to the patient. Those are the two kind of obvious things that can be done to reduce the amount of scatter in the room. So one of the biggest uh, improvements uh, is by the use of proper collimation. So collimation does, it means restricting the beam to the region of interest. There are only good things that accrue to good collimation. And it's basically a truism that if you can reduce the dose to the patient, you also reduce the dose to you, to the operators of the equipment. So it lowers levels in the room, lowers personnel exposure, it improves the image quality because less of the scatter is getting to the detector, 
and there is an overall reduction in the radiation burden to the patient. So a simple thing to do, sometimes it is uh, less obvious to do it in the kind of the heat of a procedure, but it really is something that has a significant benefit. The other thing that I would point out is where scatter is generated. So in kind of a typical geometry, a PA geometry, where the radiation is, uh, the, the x-ray source is below the patient and the detector is above the patient, the bulk of the scattering volume within the patient is actually where the beam enters the patient. That's where the beam is most intense, and that's where the scattered radiation has the least distance to go to get out of the patient. So scatter levels are actually higher towards the x-ray source than they are towards the detector. I think one of the things that uh, is often uh, not realized is the fraction of radiation that goes in compared to the fraction of radiation that comes out, and actually it's the radiation that comes out that forms the image. So the useful stuff is the stuff that appears on the exit surface of the patient, and that is typically through a belly, for example, only about 5% of the amount of radiation that's put in. So the bulk of the radiation is in fact undergoing some type of interaction. The most common interaction is the Compton interaction, meaning that the scatter levels are actually fairly, or, or scattering is a fairly common phenomenon, but the scatter does have to escape. And it's subject to uh, high attenuation levels just as the primary beam is. So the scatter levels are more intense towards the source and this means that in the lateral projection, when the tube rotates out from under the patient, that the scatter levels in the room go up. So that uh, the safest place to be is actually on the detector side. It seems counterintuitive, but in fact, scatter levels are lower at the detector side. So if you have a choice, you let the beam shoot at you. The beam is always restricted so that it's no larger than the detector. So there is no concern about the primary beam uh, exposing you. It's really scatter that is going to be the, the source of radiation. So there's no magic bullet here. It's really just common sense. We want to minimize the time to the best we can, consistent with good patient care. Obviously, when the x-ray tube is not on, there's no radiation being produced. Distance is a very powerful factor. Uh, it, it, radiation levels don't fall off as a function of distance. They actually fall off closer to a function of the distance squared. So backing off from one to two feet is actually a very significant reduction in the amount of scatter levels. It really means that, uh, for example, if you're working with a catheter inserted at the groin and you're looking at the chest, that distance uh, is actually quite protective. If on the other hand, you're sticking some of these direct sticks uh, in the area that you're imaging, the scatter levels are going to be higher and the dose levels to you will be higher. So this is, is um, uh, for you, the, the operator is sometimes difficult, but other people in the OR can certainly step back or in the procedure room can step back and distance has a strong effect. And obviously shielding. Uh, again, this is common sense. You wear protective and usually wrap around ap aprons if you're turning your back to the patient. Uh, and you use whatever floor or ceiling suspended shields uh, that are available. And there are a w wide variety of these. These can be uh, ceiling hung. They can be uh, hung from the side of the table. They do make a difference. So overall, uh, the, the levels of radiation with proper control, that meaning that with proper recognition that the levels are, are fairly high, including wearing film badges, which truthfully in the state of California is, uh, is a requirement. The film badge is normally worn outside of the apron at the collar level, and it will come back with a reading. But it does not represent uh, the, the dose to the trunk of the body, and it, is, uh, it, it does mean that the dose levels are not particularly, even over the course of, a, of a, 
active career uh, likely to, to significantly increase uh, any risk. Well, let me talk about the patient for a minute. And very quickly, I want to talk a little bit about the technology, because the technology has gone through, in the last few years, a very significant change. And the change primarily has been from the use of C-arms, which use intensified uh, image intensifiers, which is an electro-optical device. It's still a digital device, because you're digitizing a video signal and doing all the things you can do with a with a digitized image, but, the, but overall the technology is pretty simple. You, you know, you have a source, you have a device that takes a given radiation level, turns it into a visible uh, analog video image, and there's a digital processor in between. So what controls, so these are still used, they're still used in mobile C arms and in older angio equipment, still very useful. What controls the patient dose? Well, there is what's called the automatic exposure control. So this is a device that then is a feedback loop that adjusts the output of the tube, the x-ray tube, either by adjusting the KV or the MA, usually both. It does limit the maximum patient dose. So it can be set so that this feedback mechanism doesn't exceed federal and state regulations. You should be aware that when you go to magnification modes, meaning smaller fields, a bigger image, you do increase the spatial resolution, but that is at the cost of a higher dose rate to the patient. So one of the things that, is, and certainly higher resolution is very important in many situations, but in some situations a, a lower, or that is a, a less magnification can be used again with uh, appropriate collimation, and that will reduce the dose somewhat. We talked about collimation, and we also uh, talked about geometry of moving the image intensifier or the, the detector close to the patient. So here, very quickly, is the automatic brightness control. It's exactly that. It's really like an exposure meter on a camera, where it's trying to control a certain amount of light off the detector, the image intensifier, and it does that by varying the input, namely the radiation level to the patient, which consequently affects the radiation level to the image intensifier, and that's a dynamic loop so that as you pan around, this is continually operating. The KV and the MA are displayed, although uh, how that helps you is, is somewhat questionable. You kind of trust it that this brightness control mechanism is not overexposing the patient. And by and large, it works pretty well. So then we have flat panel systems. So now the image intensifier has been replaced by a detector, which is a pixelated detector, meaning the digitization occurs directly within the detector and is really a very uh, expensive, but also provides you exquisite image quality. It gives you a great deal, more, a great deal more flexibility. Its principal advantage is that it has a very broad dynamic range. And what that means is that you don't get whiteouts anymore or, or areas of black and uh, over, uh, under penetration where you can't see. They really can form an image under a, a huge range of uh, X-ray intensities. But it's not the same uh, automatic exposure control as an image intensifier based systems, and I want to talk about that for a minute. Uh, it's actually very complex. So here's what the purpose of an automatic exposure control is from the standpoint of a vendor when you go out and buy one of these flat panel systems. So it says it provides you adequate image quality. I don't disagree with that. Maintain appropriate patient dose, and by that they mean you stay within the regulations. Eliminate all manual adjustment of technique factors. And in fact, this is what they do very well. They make it simple to operate the equipment and get a good image. That's the whole intent behind it. So to provide a long x-ray tube life, maybe. But it is not a dose-saving device. That is, it is not set up 
to reduce patient exposure. It's really set up to give you a very good image quality. And it does that. And in fact, one can argue, and I would argue, that that's an appropriate thing for these to do. That is, to provide you an image that gives you assurance in what you're doing, gives you the best tool to do the procedure to help the patient. And under those settings, I think that that is entirely appropriate. Now, they can be set so that they have very low dose settings. So they can be used, and in fact, I would argue that in the setup of the equipment, it needs to have settings that allow you, where, you're, where say you're operating on a, a younger child, you really want to reduce the dose as much as possible, you can have these low dose settings. They're almost invisible to you, but they are, it is possible to put these in. So is this slide going to help you in your practice? The answer is no. But I, the reason I show it is that it is a very complex exposure control system. So here, for example, is patient thickness. So we know as the patient gets thicker, to maintain a given level of radiation to the detector, and therefore a given image quality, you have to go up in radiation levels. So this is the dose rate to the patient, and this is patient thickness. So you expect the curve to go up in some fashion. So here's a peak setting yeah, that can be set uh, by regulations, really state and federal restrictions on maximum dose rates. The problem is, and so, and so you, you reach that. Image is still created, but it's not as good an image because you'd really like a little more juice to, uh, to get the same number of X-ray photons to the detector. But the point is that between the, the range where patient thickness is uh, still allowing the automatic brightness control mechanism to vary the dose, that's under, uh, that's set by the machine. And these curves are very variable. So even, for example, if you're operating at, say, 15 frames per second, you can have the same dose rate at 15 frames per second uh, and, and have different maximum amounts. You can have the same dose level at different frame rates. So it, 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 the bottom line is that these are complex devices and it is uh, not at all clear what's going on within the machine. And there's a new variable that they have that image intensifiers don't have, and that is they change the beam filtration. The beam filtration primarily affects the skin dose, and the skin dose is one of the things we're most concerned about here because we're going to have long procedure times, and it is possible, certainly possible, to cause a burn of the patient's skin. So they, they actually now uh, dynamically vary uh, the, the amount of filtration that's put in the beam uh, as a function of patient thickness. So they always operate in pulsed fluoral, meaning that the X-ray source does not run continuously. It's pulsed, and in between the pulses, the detector is read out and an image created. How rapidly they show that image to you, they show you the same image multiple times so you don't get flicker, but you still may get jerkiness in the image if the frame rate is, is too low. So it's, it, this has been around for quite some time. It exists for image intensified systems as well. And it's always been said, well, if I change the pulse rate, I'm changing the radiation rate, the dose rate, to the patient. Unfortunately, that's not true with these new flat panel systems, or is not always true with these new. So the effect on patient dose depends on a lot of other factors. So the patient dose rate does not always scale with dose rate. In fact, there are many things that can change. The energy that's put into a given pulse, the filtration, as I mentioned, and the KV can all change from pulse to pulse. So if we have, here's patient thickness, Here's two different frame rates. Here's the maximum rate I'm going to allow. So they all approach the maximum rate, which occurs at some patient level. So over a certain range of thicknesses, I do get, in fact, the 2x reduction in dose rate that I would expect in going from 15 to 7.5 frames per second. But above a certain point, there's no difference. I've maxed out. And then there's a range in between 
where I'm getting somewhere between a 2x reduction and, and no difference. So actually, it does depend very much on patient thickness. And again, how these curves approach the maximum can be very different and depends on the machine setup. So in fact, some of them come up very quickly and then saturate. Patient dose indicators are available on these new machines. In fact, every machine since 2006. And I think it's worth knowing what these factors mean because by law, two of these are presented to you. Uh, actually, three are presented to you in the setting. Uh, that is, in, where the, in the procedure room, not at the operator console. They're available at the operator console, but they're also available in the procedure room. X-ray tube time, that's always been available on time, but it has a very weak relationship with patient skin dose. So this is something that is frequently recorded. Certainly as the on time goes up, overall dose levels to the patient are going to be higher and certainly levels to operating personnel are also going to be higher. The dose area product is the energy imparted to the patient. It has a weak relationship to patient dose, and more or less it's unintelligible, but it does relate fairly well to OR staff dose in a weak way. In other words, it's not a direct measure of that, but if this goes up, OR staff level is going up as well. And the last one, and that's the one I want to talk about a little bit, is air kerma. It's the dose at a reference point, and it's most closely associated with skin dose. This is available within the room. So there is what's called an international reference point relative to the ISO center of the CR. It's 15 centimeters towards the x-ray tube and is supposed to represent more or less where the skin entrance dose is. So, it is uh, a measured in uh, a unit of dose, milligray. It does not include, uh, uh, or it does not account for panning. And panning is a good way of reducing dose. So how can we reduce dose? We minimize the BMOM time. We position the source and the detector optimally, meaning we use inverse square law, keep the detector as close to the source, meaning as close to the patient as we can. We understand and use pulse fluoroscopy. So we understand what's happening when I change a button that says I'm gonna change the frame rate. When possible, you use fluoro loops instead of angio runs. This actually the, again, because this equipment is so good, in many cases, a fluoro capture does as good as an angio run. Gives you the information you need. You can vary the entrance port. This has to be done carefully because as you vary the infant port, in other words, you're looking at the same area for a long period of time, you recognize that the skin dose could be getting high, so you move the angulation, still looking at the same point in the body. So you vary the entrance port, and in do doing so, you may change the obliquity, meaning the thickness through which the beam has to pass to reach the image intensifier, and as such, the dose is not necessarily brought down, but at least the same entrance surface should be not be keep irradiated. And uh, we use as low of magnification as possible. So, conclusion, spend time to understand the equipment settings and be wary of the out-of-box setup conditions. Those are set up really to make the manufacturer look good by giving you a spectacular image, not necessarily to minimize patient exposure. You should be aware of patient dose indicate, indicators and before that air kerma value reaches about 3,000. This is three gray. That's the point where you would expect to see some reddening if you hadn't panned around. By the time you reach six gray, you almost certainly have it. If you reach nine gray, uh, some uh, skin, more serious skin effects can occur. And get to know your medical physicist. Thank you.